So good day, friends. This is Dr. Bob Hamilton, and you have tuned in today to the Hamilton Review, where kids and culture collide. Thank you for making us part of your day. It means a lot to me uh, when you spend time with us. And uh, if you like what you hear, write a nice review of, of us, of the Hamilton Review on Apple Podcasts, wherever you hear your podcast. We appreciate that. And um, I hope you're enjoying these podcasts. I, I have to say that is on a personal note, I really enjoy doing them. This is kind of like my graduate course in education. I'm learning when I, when I get to meet these amazing people that I bring on my show every week. I feel honored uh, to have them on my show, first of all. And I also feel like I, I learn every time I do a podcast, I have to say, friends, that I'm learning uh, as much as you guys learn as well, because I get to meet uh, some amazing people. And today... It's a pleasure to welcome uh, to the the show uh, a professor emeritus from the University of Toronto. He is in the Department of Kinesiology and Physical Education. His, his name is Peter Donnelly, Dr. Peter Don, Donnelly. And uh, there was an article that was written. First of all, Peter, welcome to the Hamilton Review. It's good to be here. Such a pleasure to have you. Um, I read an article a couple of a couple of months ago. It was the article was in Wall Street Journal. It was entitled, Do Young Gymnasts and Skaters Need Protections Like the Ones Children's Children Actors Have? And essentially the subtitle was Elite Competitors in These and Other Sports Can Practice 30 Hours a Week or More While Barely in Their Teens. Uh, this calls for a growing need to regulate their activities as work not play. We're going to talk about this article uh, as we move through this program. But before we do, Peter Donnelly, I'd like you to introduce yourself to my listeners. Tell us a little bit about who you are, your background, where you grew up as a kid. And um, we'll go from there. So Peter Donnelly, the, the microphone belongs to you. Um, hi. Hi. I grew up in England. I was born during the Second World War and uh, and grew up through some deprived times in a working class family, but uh, uh, never realized that we were not well off. Um, uh, I went through education and childhood fairly well. Um, eventually went to a teacher's training college and became uh, in the mid '60s, uh, physical education teacher, first in primary school, and then for about a year and a half in uh, in secondary school in the East End of London, and uh, and uh, realized that being a physical education teacher was not probably the best thing I wanted to be, but uh, I also needed uh, to do something else, so. I had already done some traveling and uh, and my sport at that time was rock climbing and mountaineering. And I'd been to the Alps, I'd been to North Africa, hitchhiking. And I decided that uh, I would leave my work as a teacher and head for North America where uh, I settled in New York and for, for a while worked uh, in part-time jobs. Um, Connect, reconnected with a woman that I'd met in Europe who lived in New York, and we ended up being married within six months of me landing. So, uh, so I had a green card and went back to university to Hunter College in New York in order to uh, to qualify to be a teacher in the United States and uh, and doing a senior thesis with one of the professors. She uh, persuaded me to go to graduate school and I thought well if I go for a master's degree um, I will have to do that anyway if I'm going to be a teacher in the United States in New York State anyway and uh, and then the research bug bit me and uh, I went on to a PhD at the University of Massachusetts. Amazing amazing story so you grew up in in uh, a relatively smaller community uh, you told me Chester England yeah. Uh, tell us a little bit about Chester, England, and tell us a little bit about your uh, your life as a kid, because I think this plays a lot into uh, what you're doing today. Um, 
Chester, England is in the northwest of England. It's uh, it's probably about 12 miles from Liverpool. So uh, people have a better sense of where Liverpool is. So it's in, in that region. It's on the Welsh border. Um, I was a sickly kid in some ways. I had asthma, childhood asthma, uh, which I grew out of when I was about 16. But um, I can remember spending some sunny days lying in bed after uh, an asthma attack or during an asthma attack and listening to my friends playing outside. But when I didn't have asthma, I was outside playing with them, uh, <coughs> playing uh, uh, street games uh, and also uh, exploring neighborhoods and exploring the nearby countryside. I had different hobbies, all, all hobbies that would be frowned on today. Uh, uh, collecting birds' eggs, uh, collecting uh, butterflies and moths and, uh, and mounting them, uh, all of those kinds of things. And I regret that now, but um, it was the kind of things that uh, uh, respectable working class kids were doing in, in those days. Sure. Yeah. I mean, it's funny today, Peter, that I don't think that kids are, uh, today even know what a hobby is. Uh, a lot of a lot of they don't. I mean, it's very interesting that you kind of talk about hobbies, and a lot of kids don't know what what does that mean. And because uh, I ask that question frequently, and not too many hobbies out there. Certainly, collecting eggs. What kind of eggs did you collect? Like chicken eggs, or what kind of eggs? Oh no, uh, wild bird eggs, <clears throat> uh, and getting into all kinds of adventures, climbing trees and through hedges to uh, to get to the nests. So you're up there, you were climbing to get the wild birds. Are those birds now extinct, by the way, as a result I, of your collection? I, think, I don't think I had an egg that was that rare. Okay. All right. I'm <laughs> glad to hear that. <laughs> what about the butterflies and moths that you were collecting? I think they were also fairly common as well, although okay. Okay. Uh, they're Great. going extinct for different reasons these days. Other than Peter Donnelly. Okay. Because yeah. I've been blaming it on you for a long time here, Peter. <laughs> so um well that's that's good and you were you were a kid I, you you know you were taught when in our pre-conversation uh yesterday you mentioned a, a quote from piaget which uh he says that play is the work of children i and i and i agree with that uh certainly as a child growing up i had plenty of, of free time to play i ran you know in the neighborhood I, we had i mean look we lived near woods we played in the woods we climbed trees we made forts we did all sorts of fun things like that and i i think that in today's world uh free play that kind of open-ended play is is becoming more rare it is becoming more rare and i think that um we've since the 1980s probably we've emerged into a style of parenting that means the parents uh need to schedule their kids in organized activities if they're able and also that parents need to be able to account to each other um uh, where for where their children are 24 hours a day seven days a week so uh, uh that kind of surveillance has uh, has been a killer of uh, of the kind of play adventures that uh, earlier generations enjoy what do you what do you think about that? I mean, I, we we call it you know in, in down here in, or out here in in Los Angeles we call that a little bit of helicopter parenting and and also to a degree it, you know for working parents who need to have some kind of supervision of, of their children they're not there in the home I think they look at these activities as being an opportunity to be able to drop their child off at maybe a camp or something and then be gone at work or whatever. But how do you, uh, what are your thoughts about that kind of scheduled, uh, constantly scheduled activities for children? I think it's a problem. I think um, they don't get the play experiences. They don't get the independence. They don't get the creativity. Um, and I think there is a solution. I argue with, I call it either the, the, the the lifeguard or the recess supervision model. That is where there's a responsible adult uh, who's, who's keeping their eye on things, but not interfering unless it's really necessary. Um, and so 
Uh, I know that there are adventure playgrounds, but real adventure play playgrounds in a number of countries now where uh, kids have old tires, cardboard boxes, wood, hammer, nails, fire, uh, uh, all kinds of things that, uh, that kids in the past played with. But now it's in uh, a more enclosed environment um, with a couple of adults around who are just watching that uh, nobody is attacking anybody else. Nobody is about to set themselves on fire or hammer a nail into their mm -hmm. finger. But, you know, I mean, even hammering a nail into your finger, quite often kids have done that accidentally or they've hit themselves on the thumb while they are hammering a nail. And we've done that as ad adults as well. It, it's, I, to me, that's a part of growing up, you know, to yeah. deny like, those kind of experiences uh, and the creativity that can come of those is, I think, really problematic. I, Peter, I can't, you know, when you say hitting your thumb with the, with the hammer, I, I can't tell you how many times I hit my thumb with a hammer. Now, now, mind you, that did help me to kind of work on my eye-hand coordination. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm, I don't do that as much anymore, but I don't, actually don't hammer too much anymore either. But yes, it, and, and the kind of the forts we built uh, were built with hammers and, you know, hammers and nails. And uh, sometimes the nail came through the wood and we would, there were all sorts of, you know, sharp points that you had to negotiate when you went into the fort. Um, those were happy moments in my life. And I, and I do rue the fact that kids don't have that, that open creativity, partly because I think there's a concern that kids are going to get hurt. And maybe I think in a more uh, supervised environment, say like this, what you're talking about, there's legal ramifications, I suppose, as well. And uh, that's something that, um, uh, that I think that's above my pay grade how to fix that one. Right. But I think even, even um, early introduction to sports uh, should probably be a hands-off introduction. Uh, you know, kids always have a sense of how to play uh, a game of baseball or soccer. Um, and and they develop skills in that random free play that uh, uh, so I think that's uh, you know with with some hands-off supervision um, I think kids can work it out for themselves yeah I mean uh, you know Peter when we were kids we played in the street I mean that was kind of how we did it we had a neighborhood and we played kickball we played baseball we played football went down to the park and played basketball so it was all organized by us I, I don't think i when i i think i finally got into organized uh activities when i joined little league is probably i was 10 11 years of age at that point in time and uh before that time my my i mean we played plenty of baseball uh but it was us doing it was really the sandlot baseball that we you know you kind of think about talk about nostalgically but it wasn't this organized activities where adults were involved at all it was really you know, we picked our teams and then we all had at it, you know, and it was those were uh, how we how we learned how to play different sports. Um, probably picked up a lot of bad habits along the way. Well, you know, I think I think that still exists in in some of the street sports, um, the skateboarders, the BMX bikers, uh, uh, those kids um, are self-coached and peer coached. Uh, they develop. Uh, some of them develop enormously admirable levels of skill without an adult ever being part of the picture. Uh, and I think, I think that's admirable. And I think that, that that is an indication. And very often those kids who are doing the skateboarding, the BMX biking are kids that have uh, been turned off by organized uh, youth sports. Yeah. No, you know what? I, I that's interesting you mentioned that because you're totally right, and uh, I never thought of it like that. Um, I think surfing here in California is part of that too, where kids who are a little more independent, kind of minded kids, they're they're out in the water, they're out in the ocean, and they're learning how to surf. And some I have some kids in my my practice who are really who are becoming like professional surfers, but they kind of picked it up. Uh, from each other, just being out in the water. And I, you're totally right. These BMX uh, bikers and they, these stunt kids 
Uh, I think that there is no adult supervision because I think adults are terrified to do what these kids do. <laughs> I don't think I don't I don't think any adults would ever want to even attempt to do that. So these guys are a world unto themselves, right? And, um, and they've broken broken out from adult supervision. Yeah, they really have, and yeah. I think the adults kind of look at it, kind of go, you know, they try to dress them up in in all in all sorts of gear to keep them from breaking a bone and their head in particular. But uh, kind of, I, I watch these kids at the park, you know, drop into these uh, empty. They look like they look like swimming pools, mm -hmm. but of course there are these uh, these uh, skate parks, which are just incredible. Um, okay, well, listen, Peter, we're going to take a two minute break here and we're going to come right back. I do want to get into this article that I read because I think this is really the crux of of where um, something very near and dear to your heart. So, um, friends, you're listening to the Hamilton Review. We're having a conversation today with Peter Donnelly, who's a emeritus professor at the University of Toronto. We're going to be talking about the um, about the need to. Uh, control the amount of hours that are being uh, these uh, young athletes are are uh, undergoing in their prep in their their workouts so we'll be right back don't go away take care the hamilton review podcast is brought to you by hamilton babies nine kid-friendly products designed for the little loves in your life find them at hamiltonbabies.com or amazon.com also consider dr hamilton's recently published book seven secrets of the newborn Available at Barnes & Noble, your local independent bookstore, and Amazon.com. So, friends, welcome back to the Hamilton Review. We're continuing our conversation today with Dr. Peter uh, Donnelly. He's a uh, professor emeritus of kinesiology and physical education. And, Peter, this article I read that I referenced before, let me read the first paragraph or two of it because I think it sets the stage very nicely about what is on your mind. Here's the article, quote, for almost four decades, Peter Donnelly has been pushing an idea he says others seem to find unfathomable. When child athletes train hours a day, forego a normal education and put themselves at regular risk of stress and injury, they're working, not playing. And they need the legal pr protections that come with that. When it comes to sports, Dr. Donnelly says that there was a there is a willful blindness to consider the negatives. Uh, what if McDonald's, he says, had the same accident rate or anywhere that employs large numbers of young people or schools? There would be a huge commissions of inquiry, regulations, and policies. And I and I think Peter end of quote. I think Peter, what you're saying is that these these young athletes are practicing up to thirty hours a week, which is, in my mind, darn near a full-time job. Yeah. It is. And, and it's, it's, it's really problematic. And I think I should probably begin by talking about how I got into this. Yeah. And it was, um, I first heard the, the term child labor used in relation to sport in 1981 at a conference. And a colleague of mine uh, who had been doing research in Russia or the USSR at that time. Um, he, he talked about the sports systems in East Germany and Russia, but also the one city was seeing in the Canada, United States, Australia, who that were doing the same thing, intensive training, uh, early specialization, um, leading to high performance or elite, uh, elite sports. And I thought about that. Um, my own children were three by that time, three or four years old, not really ready to start sport, but it, it got me thinking. And then a couple of years later, just around the time uh, that my kids were of an age where they would start to uh, be playing kid soccer, that kind of thing. Um, I read Neil Postman's The Disappearance of Childhood, and my wife met a woman at an exercise class who had just joined her exercise class, and they were talking in the locker room, and the woman turned out had been a national team athlete in Canada, had, uh, had uh, been ranked sixth in the country at one point in her sports, and she 
told my wife that she was recently divorced. She had married her coach when she was in her late teens um, and was recently divorced. And she said that she had uh, lost her childhood and lost her adolescence to the sport that she participated in. And that struck me really profoundly after the other things I'd been doing and, and thinking about. And so I, I asked my wife if she, if, if she could ask her if she would be interested in, in, in doing an interview. And we talked for about two hours when we did the interview. And I called this set of interviews, I did the good, the bad, and the ugly. Mm -hmm. And I really wanted to know what people felt was good about their participation. Yeah. And they all said, uh, being really good at something um, uh, or excelling at something, the travel. And then it, they didn't have very much to say. It took about two minutes to deal with the good. And I think we don't have a good vocabulary for it. I mean, there is a lot more to good of participation than that, but we don't have a good vocabulary for it. We, we tend to go into cliches. But when I asked about the bad and the ugly, uh, she went on for uh, probably most of the two hours. And then I began to, uh, I ended up with about 48 interviews with different um, uh, recently retired uh, national team athletes uh, in Canada um, in a variety of different sports, men and women. And the, the interviews were, continued to be the same. It was very little on the good, although they really had enjoyed and persevered. But people said things to me like, uh, you know, I really wanted to drop out when I was about 15. But I realized that my mother or my father wanted it more than I did. And that was really difficult for me to drop out. Um, others talked about uh, the various abuses, psychological uh, uh, dietary abuses, um, uh, uh, physical abuses, you know, exercises, punishment, um, and, and occasionally people talked about sexual abuses, and some of them uh, spoke about it for the very first time. They'd never talked to anybody else about it before. And so this series of interviews really got me going. I began to look uh, what would be remedy for this, and that's when I began to look at um, uh, children's rights um, treaties and also at child labor uh, uh, regulations. But of course, nobody wanted to hear it. Nobody wants to associate, you know, the play with work uh, or, you know, to hear anything bad about, about uh, sport participation for children. And, uh, and, uh, you know, it was a struggle. It was a struggle for many years. Yeah. You know, I think that we esteem uh, kids who we see are very gifted. We look at that and, we, and there's so much accolades that they received because they're so good. And uh, we go, wow, you're great. You're great. And there's there's that thing that happens. I think you mentioned, uh, Peter, that uh, music and dance are uh, also have to be included in that, in that list of things that, you know, that tend to... Uh, overwhelm the the time of for these kids and and they're they are pushed a little bit and the, and the fact that the, when you say that their parents wanted it more than they did that is means that they're being you know kind of pushed along by by others uh, and i'm sure in addition to parents their coaches sometimes want it more than they do too a, a, a german professor who was looking at this in uh, in the 1980s came up with the best quote for me. He said that uh, no child ever thought on their own of uh, doing the same activity six hours a day, six, five or six days a week, uh, um, and, and just doing that. Uh, that's an adult concept. Okay? Yeah. And, yeah. and even though adults say, oh, my child wants to do it, the idea came from, and your praise for them and your uh, support for them uh, doing that uh, leads to the point eventually where sometimes the kids feel too guilty to, you know, you have invested so much in it. How could they stop? How could they go to do something else? Um, and it's that 
early specialization on intensive training, that becomes really problematic. And particularly when uh, money gets involved in those relationships, yeah. uh, paying yeah, coaches, uh, paying uh, trainers, paying uh, uh, pe where people are making money out of children's performance. Uh, and to have that as an unregulated environment is for me really problematic. And also not that terrific according to a massive amount of research where people have been comparing early specialization the results of early specialization with the results of uh, kids who, who play a number of different sports and activities. And the evidence really seems to be tipping towards uh, the fact that uh, most people on national teams in most sports uh, have, uh, have had a varied experience during their childhood with sport, that they did not focus on one sport uh, for the whole year. Yeah, no, I, I, I think that this is a newer, newer phenomenon that kids do even very early on, you know, seven, eight, nine, ten 10 years of age are only doing you know, one sport, baseball, base, you know, fall ball, they call it here in California and, and throughout, you know, spring uh, baseball and summer ball. And, you know, you kind of go, there are other things out there. There's, you know, there, there are other activities that you can engage in. So I do uh, gently encourage people, but the problem is that you end up having uh, this kind of cultural in these environments, you have this cultural pressure to continue to focus and, and it's hard to break out of that. Yeah, it is. I think the one sport in the United States um, of, of the major professional sports, the one sport that has really broken out or is breaking out of this is ice hockey with the American development model. And the American development model encourages lots of mini games uh, during the hockey season and encourages kids to participate in other sports when it's not the hockey season. But in, in they're still in parts of the States and in most of Canada, uh, if you are good at ice hockey, it's a 12 month a year. Uh, um, yeah, thing. yeah, no, and the same thing, I mean, there are, there are kids who only play basketball, only kids who play baseball. Yeah. And, and it's the kind of thing where, um, I mean, do they, I, do kids like it? They do. I mean, they, they do enjoy, I, I have grandchildren, for example, one I'm thinking about right now, who, who has a good time playing, he plays baseball and he, he likes it. He has a good time. So it's hard to say, no, you can't play baseball. You're going to be doing something else. Um, but that is, so you kind of are, are finding yourself kind of, uh, you know, it's hard to know how to negotiate that sometimes. Um, I have a question for you. When, you know, at what age do you think that kids can begin to specialize in the sport? Some of the great Soviet uh, hockey teams, uh, ice hockey teams of the 80s, 70s and 80s, um, they didn't start to play a formal organized ice hockey until they were in their early teens around 12 wow. years of age. Um, that is the case now, um, I think still in Sweden, uh, which has been uh, uh, an important country in ice hockey. And it's the case with almost all sports in, uh, in Norway. Norway has in recent years um, been uh, the most successful uh, country in the Winter Olympics, and Norway has a population of less than five million. Yeah. And yet they are they are beating giant countries like the United States, Canada, and uh, and China in in the Winter Olympics. And um, you kind of wonder why, don't you? I mean, yeah, you know, and, you know. Yeah, and they it, have had uh, since two thousand and six. They've had a, a a children's rights ethic that has governed all of children's participation in, in sports in Norway. And that children's rights ethic um, it, it focuses on free play and low supervision play until 
kids are about uh, nine or 10 years old. And then when, and I don't have the exact numbers at hand, but it is, it is much later than in countries like yours and mine. Um, and when they do start to play organized sports, uh, the scores are never recorded, even in leagues for the first few years. And then by the early teens, uh, children are uh, encouraged to, to start specializing in, in one or more sports, uh, maybe different sports for different seasons. And yeah. that, the result of that has been massive participation levels where something between 80 and 90% of children are involved in sports and physical activity of various kinds and where um, they have been doing amazingly well at the Winter Olympics and certainly hitting way above their weight at Summer Olympics. Um, that is incredible that they have that level of, uh, of uh, percent of participation because that is something that it, that's very laudable because, uh, you know, we want, we want, I listen, I, in my pediatric practice, I, I tell parents, get your kids involved, get your kids outside of your house, get them out playing, engaging with sports and activities. And I will tell you that even with my, my attempts to encourage people, I would say that the, the level of participation may be 40, 50, 40, 50%. Um, and I'm, I'm guessing here, I haven't really done the numbers, but I, but I know that a lot of kids don't, you know, they don't like something. They don't like, maybe they don't like soccer or whatever. And they kind of have a tendency not to want to do anything, but I, I love that level of participation is something that we need to uh, attempt to emulate. Project, but, play, project play at the Aspen Institute has been serving American kids for a while now and asking uh, what they like about sports and what they don't like about sports. And the results are just fascinating. What they like is playing sports. What they don't like is adults yelling at them. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You know? and and I think, that I think competitive that. spirit that we unfortunately uh, infuse into these activities for our kids. And, and you know what? I remember, look, I remember playing baseball and getting very, very anxious when the stands were full of adults watching me, you know, and when I swung and missed, uh, there were half of the, the people who said, yay. And then, <laughs> and then when I, and then when I got a hit, other people said, yay, you know, and so it does kind of put an incredible amount of pressure on these poor kids. That was where I like to play sandlot baseball when no one was watching me. Right. Uh, it did. It was a very different dynamic. Um, so Peter, what are you what are you proposing? You just wrote a white paper, and I want I want you to talk a little bit about this. This is a very important part of who you are. So the white paper that was written was for the Center for Sport and Human Rights, uh, which is an international organization, um, and they, and it was presented at the global conference this year for the elimination of child labor, and it argued that, uh, that there was a real need for regulation, uh, that children's activities are regulated in every other area of their life. There's, a, uh, there's an age at which they can go to work. There's an age at which they have to go to school. There's uh, an age before which they, can, they cannot drive. You know, so we regulate children in all kinds of ways. And yet a 14 year old talented a uh, soccer player or gymnast trains as many hours as a 19 or 20 year old soccer player and gymnast. And there's no distinction between children and adults when it comes to talent in sport. Uh, and I think that we need to begin to think of children as a protected class, a protected class where there are limitations, where there are protections, where there are not expectations, that they uh, do what adults do. You know, I, I, I agree. And I think that <clears throat> these kids who are who are missing out, I mean, I, 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 when you share with me this, these conversations you had with these former athletes, um, the fact that they felt like they had missed out on their childhood, that they had missed out on their adolescence, that to me, it almost kind of pierces me in the chest. 
Exactly. I hear that. And and I think that, you know, you probably do need some kind of regulation, even some kind of boundaries that people are required to fall within. Yeah, I think you really do. Um, what we've developed at the moment is an, an exclusive system of sports. We, we exclude kids who don't show early talent. We exclude kids who just want to play. Uh, and we've, we've kind of ended what I call the right to play battle. And I think that we need to encourage the right to play badly. I mean, people do that in pickup games, but pickup games are getting to be rare and rarer. Uh, you know, they, they do, it, 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 you see them in basketball, of course, and you see occasionally ice hockey pickup games and some touch football pickup games. But, um, but it gets to be not considered as real sport. And I think, you know, the real sport um, is just getting, getting rid of kids who need more coaching, <laughs> getting rid yeah. of kids who, who, who need more time, uh, that kind of thing. And, and, and that turns off the vast majority of kids to organize sports. They end up thinking that they hate sports when they haven't been given the opportunity to enjoy, to develop, to develop more slowly than perhaps other kids, and to and to to uh, to have fun playing. Yeah, <clears throat> I mean, kids need to mature. I mean, there everybody doesn't mature, as we all know, at the same level, exactly. same rate. Yeah. So, what are you proposing, uh, Doctor Donnelly? What it, What are your? Uh, do you have any you know clear recommendations that you're proposing to this board? I, at this time, I think that. Uh, just getting people to uh, to think of a different way of doing it. Um, probably the best comparison we have at the moment is children in uh, theater, film, television, uh, children in you know acting or modeling, where they are covered often by union agreements, often by regulations that protect their income that protect their education, that protect the number of hours that they're permitted to work and, and, and rehearse. And so um, those protections could easily be transferred to children who are in a high performance uh, level of sport. We even have protections for, uh, you know, I'm not sure how well they're honored, but in, in NCAA university sports, uh, there's supposed to be a maximum of 20 hours a week for what are essentially adults who are partic participating in university sports. We have nothing mm -hmm. like that for, for much younger athletes who are often training and competing and traveling many, many more hours than that. Yeah, I mean, I mean when you think about that, 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 you know, that kind of boggle, you know, boggles my mind that, you know, you know, 20, 20 hours a week for the college kids, but 30 hours a week for these younger kids, very high, obviously highly disruptive to their to their lives, both academically and just socially as well. And you're right. There's some of these uh, what they call travel clubs, uh, the club teams that are or travel teams, they call them here in California. These kids are on the road a lot. They're on the road almost every weekend. And it's almost impossible for the, them to have even friendships with kids in the neighborhood because they're never in the neighborhood. They're always yeah. on the road uh, with, with that select group of kids and not really getting to know other kids in their, in their, uh, in their neighborhood. And there's some interesting, <clears throat> there's some interesting British research that uh, uh, indicates how disrupted that, uh, disrupted that is for family life. Um, uh, the, uh, this research showed that the divorce rate for a parents with a highly talented athlete child was much higher than the national uh, divorce rate. Um, and that sibling relationships were really problematic, particularly if only one of the siblings was, uh, was talented and all of the family's time and finance were being invested in that one child. And it was, it was very disruptive of 
of sibling relationships. And and that that to me is is pretty obvious that that would be the case, right? I mean, you can see how that would be. There's no uh, no question about that. Well, I, I do think that you know, listen, Peter. I think that what you're doing is is very very important. I think th this is an issue that really does need to come uh, before the people who are, have the power to make laws like this and that the national boards that you're speaking with. And I really ap applaud the fact that you have been doing this for. 40 years and uh, a little bit of a voice crying in the wilderness, but maybe uh, maybe this your, your time is coming and um, <clears throat> they're going to see some reforms uh, within within this world, because I, I actually do believe that this is very. Listen, I, I'm a big believer, big believer in sports activities. I certainly as a uh, young kid enjoyed participation in many, many different sports, football, baseball, basketball, track and field. I mean, a lot of things I was able to do as a kid growing up, but um, they were really very much voluntary and they were very, they occurred in, in a later point in my life, not as a young child, that's for sure. And so I think that this, and I, I, I think I look, I look back fondly because it was my decision and it wasn't like I was subjected to over intense, uh, a competition at, at, a, at a too young of an age. So uh, what you're doing is is a good thing, Peter, and I want to encourage you. Uh, and um, thank you for for thank you for your love for kids and your and your love for uh, uh, normalcy in their lives. Yeah, I think, and I thank you. And I just wanted to finish with one one more thing. That is yeah. that uh, uh, national sport organizations. Uh, very often feel that uh, um, if we don't continue the current practice, that our country will not win so many medals, that we will not achieve the same kind of success that we have in sports if we don't uh, have this early specialization, early intensive training. And yet the research is beginning to show, particularly from countries like Norway, like Sweden, like uh, like Cuba, that uh, that uh, 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 broad-based uh, participation at younger ages uh, has even more success at, at the top level. There you go. So that's why we need to do what you're what you're recommending, Peter. So uh, I hope that your proposals are successful in getting people's attention, and I hope that we see some changes in in the days to come. Well, listen, friends, we have been uh, having a very interesting conversation today with Peter Donnelly. He is a pro professor emeritus at uh, University of Toronto in the area of kinesiology and physical education. We're talking about, we've been talking about uh, the over workouts of young kids and the importance of some kind of regulation on that. So, Peter, you have been a wonderful guest. Thank you for being here today. Thank you so much. And friends, until next time, take care, be encouraged. Bye-bye. You have been listening to the Hamilton Review, where kids and culture collide. Thank you for allowing us to be a part of your day. Tune in again next week on Apple Podcasts. Rate and comment and tell a friend.